Nobody on this earth has ever counterfeited more money than I did and better than I did. Meet Frank Barassa, a guy known for making fake money. He whipped up a massive $250 million in counterfeit bills, making him one of the top counterfeiters ever in the US. What's really amazing about him is how he made his fake cash look just like the real one, fooling even the experts. Barasa tricked everyone with his perfect fake bills, blurring the line between what's real and what's not. But the question is, how did he do it? And what happened next? This is a true story filled with mystery, twists, and even a couple of corrupt government agents. Welcome to the fascinating story of Frank Barasa's $250 million counterfeit empire. Frank Barassa was born on 23rd May 1970 in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, but soon he got caught up in a life of crime. When he was just 12, he saw older kids at school stealing clothes from the mall. Frank thought he could do the same. He wanted to be independent, so he started stealing clothes too. Frank began selling these stolen clothes for money. He made a few hundred dollars a week. He liked the feeling of making his own money and being in control, but little did he know, his journey was just getting started. At the age of 15, Frank's life took a turn when he was kicked out of school and left his parents' home. Wanting to make money, he got a job as a mechanic, but he also sold stolen cars on the other side. He had good relations with some car dealers who were buying his stolen cars. He stole around more than 50 cars and sold them to dealers. Balancing his legal job with his illegal one wasn't easy. Eventually, he finally decided to focus on legal work. He started his own business making brake pads for cars. It was a big risk, but Frank believed in himself. He was working 20-hour days to make his small business a success, and his hard work paid off. But he felt like he was working all day and night, hardly getting any sleep. It was tough. The constant work made him very stressed, and he had to take a lot of pills to calm down. Finally, Frank decided to sell his brake business. It was a hard choice, but he knew it was for the best. After that, he feels like he is done with working normal jobs. This was a big moment for Frank. It made him realize he needed to do things differently, with a clear mind. But Frank will be Frank. He again engaged in illegal activities. Some of his old friends are making good money from smuggling pot. And he thought, why not give it a try? Joining the smugglers turned out to be a good move for Frank bringing in lots of cash. He is making a good amount of money, but everything changed one day in 2006. The police raided a grow operation run by one of Frank's suppliers. Caught up in the mess, Frank faced a drug charge. He ended up getting a 12-month sentence, but he only ended up serving three months of it. After getting in trouble with the law, Frank started thinking about his life. He knew he couldn't keep smuggling pot forever. Then one day, Frank had a big realization. He looked back on all the different jobs he'd done and how he always worked hard to make money. And he thought, why not skip everything and just start making money? Now it was time for the real fun to begin. When most people look at a dollar bill, they don't just see a piece of paper. They see something magical, representing luck, hard work, and their own worth compared to others. But for Frank, it was different. He saw dollar bills as something he could make himself. Frank started learning about making fake money by hanging out in online chat rooms where counterfeiters talked. He also visited the US Secret Service's website, which has a detailed guide on how real money is made. Frank realized that making fake money was technically possible even though it seemed really hard. He knew it wouldn't be easy, but since money is made by people, it's possible for him to do it too. He decided that if he was going to do this, he'd do it on a big scale. Frank believes that serious counterfeiters don't use the fakey money themselves. Instead, they sell it in large amounts. The internet told Frank that a good fake bill could be sold for 30% of its face value. So Frank thought if he was going to go through all the trouble and expense of making fake money, he might as well make enough to be set for life. He thought that printing around $200 million worth of fake money would be enough. But it's important to understand that this amount is not just big, it's crazy huge. Interestingly, printing all that fake money turned out to be a good thing for Frank later on, especially when his luck went bad. Frank learned from news stories about counterfeiters who failed. He made a list of rules to follow for his own fake money business. First, he decided don't ever try to pass the money on to yourself. 
you want to be as far away as possible from where the money is being spent. Second, he would only sell his fake money to people outside of his area. He knew he had to sell it in Europe or Asia. Third, he decided to make $20 bills instead of $100 bills. It's easier to pass 20s because people don't check them as carefully. Fourth, Frank knew he couldn't use cheap materials. Many failed counterfeiters use cheap materials, which is one of the biggest mistakes they made. Frank knew that if he wanted to succeed, his fake bills had to be perfect, just like real ones. Now the thing is where to accomplish this plan. So, Frank took his equipment to a garage outside of town, which he rented from a farmer who didn't ask any questions. The farmer knew a little about what Frank was up to, but didn't mind. Frank turned the garage into a print shop that any beginner counterfeiters would envy. He used the money which he earned from his past illegal business. Frank had no experience in professional printing, but he knew someone who used to work at a print shop and had been to prison. This person helped Frank buy the right equipment. With the help of his new expert, Frank bought a fancy four-color offset printer for $125,000. He also got a cheaper single-color printer for test runs, as well as other machines for embossing and adding special foil, cutting paper, making plates, and counting money. He also bought inkjet printers for printing serial numbers. Overall, he spent a lot of money on all this equipment. The total cost for all the equipment and materials was about $300,000. That might sound like a lot, but Frank planned to make fake bills worth around $80 million with it so $300,000 seemed like nothing to him. But getting the special paper for the fake bills was tricky. It's made of 75% cotton and 25% linen, a mix that gives real US bills their unique feel. But if you call a paper mill and ask for this special mix, you'll probably get a visit from the Secret Service, who are always on the lookout for counterfeiters. Even if you manage to somehow get your hands on the cotton linen mix, you'd still need to add a bunch of security features. Like the watermark, which is a see-through image of Jackson, Franklin, and others that shows up when you hold the bill up to the light. There's also a security strip, tiny red and blue fibers in the paper, and more. In 2008, Frank started contacting paper mills in Europe and Asia using the fake name Thomas Moore. He pretended to work for a company called The Letter Shop, based in Quebec. Frank claimed he had a client who needed a unique type of paper made. Hello, I am uh, Thomas Moore looking for a paper. What kind of paper? Well, rag paper with cotton, maybe some linen thrown in there. Cotton and linen, like for currency. Frank was determined to find a paper maker willing to make the special paper he needed. After searching across Europe, he finally found a company called Artaz in Switzerland. Using the name Jackson Maxwell, Frank claimed to represent a securities firm called Keystone Investment and Trading Company. He told Artos that Keystone wanted to print bond certificates on secure rag paper with custom security features. In his correspondence with Artos, Frank gradually revealed more details about his plan. He convinced them to add linen to the paper and to include chemicals that would prevent security tests. He even persuaded them to sew in a security strip with tiny text that read, USA 20 to make it seem like it was for $20 bonds. Artos was ready to add a watermark to his paper, an image pressed into the paper while it's still wet. To do this, he paid $15,000 for the equipment from a company in Germany. He used a surrogate's name and a Swiss bank account to make the purchase. Frank thought it was easy because to someone in Germany, Andrew Jackson was just some guy's face, not a famous figure. Frank knew how to work his way around people, and his skills paid off when Arto sent him sample sheets of the perfect paper for counterfeiting. He was impressed. It looked just like real currency paper. So, he ordered $50,000 worth of it. When shipment finally reached the docks, Frank wasted no time in claiming his prize, knowing that his journey was far from over. Now that he had everything he needed, Frank thought making fake money would be easy. After adjusting the colors for a bit, he was amazed by how good the bills looked coming out of the printer. When he saw the first perfect sheet, it hit him hard. After dodging trouble and chasing money for so long, he finally felt like he had hit the jackpot. According to Frank, his small workshop was quickly producing millions of dollars worth of perfect $20 bills every month. Frank was making money, but he had a problem. He didn't know where to sell his fake cash. So, he asked a friend to help him find people who might want to buy it. He had been talking to some drug guys, heavy workers who were moving cocaine and other people who were doing illegal activity. 
They all are not interested in Frank money, but they told him to be careful. Frank is struggling to find buyers, so he hired another person, George, to help him. They spent months packing sample boxes to send to potential clients, but Frank wasn't making any money from it. Eventually, they found four buyers who wanted to sell the fake bills overseas. However, these buyers only wanted small amounts at first, which disappointed Frank, but their orders gradually increased to a million dollars a week each. Frank sold them the bills for 30 cents on the dollar, which allowed him to make back his initial investment of $300,000. Despite this success, Frank worried about the police catching on to his operation if it took too long to sell all the counterfeit money. In looking for a new buyer, Frank sent George to meet various people around the world, but none of these connections led to any deals. Eventually, George contacted a local man named Eric Lefebvre in Trois-Rivières, who was involved in selling stolen heavy equipment. Lefebvre had unknowingly been selling stolen machinery to an undercover police officer for two years. One day, Lefebvre asked the officer if he was interested in buying counterfeit money, and the officer agreed. Frank, feeling unusually confident, personally delivered $100,000 worth of counterfeit bills to Lefebvre, who then passed them on to the officer. The officer was satisfied with the quality and ordered another $100,000 the next day. When Frank went to deliver the second batch of money, he had a strange feeling that something wasn't right. Despite not seeing or hearing anything unusual, he decided to be cautious and parked in the driveway instead of carrying the boxes inside right away. This small act of caution would later prove to be a wise decision. On May 23, 2012, something unexpected happened which Frank had no idea. Frank Barassa woke up to the sound of men yelling and banging on his girlfriend's door. It was the police. Frank told his girlfriend not to say or do anything and went downstairs to answer the door. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police and agents from the U.S. Secret Service were there. They handcuffed Frank and searched the house. Inside, they found guns, computers, and equipment for making counterfeit money. They also discovered nearly a million dollars in fake 20s. The police were excited about the discovery, thinking they had caught Frank's entire operation, but they didn't know about the $200 million hidden in the garage. Frank was worried but also frustrated with the police's excitement over what he considered just samples of his work. He knew he was in trouble, but he also couldn't help feeling annoyed by the police's reaction. At the police station, Frank was questioned by officers for hours. They accused him of many crimes, including having guns and drugs and making fake money. Frank mostly stayed quiet, but when they mentioned his girlfriend being arrested, he got scared. He insisted she was innocent and didn't know about the fake money. Then, the officers from the Secret Service dropped a bombshell, telling Frank he could face up to 20 years in prison for each charge, adding up to a potential 60 years behind bars. Frank was shocked and scared, realizing how serious his situation was. The Secret Service agents quit the room, and Frank Barassa is sent to jail without bond. The Canadian government's legal team, known as the Crown, didn't want to talk much about Frank's case. So, we have to rely on what Frank Barassa said happened. According to him, his lawyer found a way to help him avoid being sent to the United States for trial. In Canada, the police need strong evidence to get a search warrant. Frank's lawyer argued that because the surveillance video only showed Frank bringing his car into the driveway, but not carrying any boxes of cash into the house, the warrant used for the raid might not have been based on enough evidence. This argument wasn't very strong, but there was a chance it could work to get the case thrown out of court. Frank made a money deal with the Canadian government. If they stopped trying to send him to the US, his lawyer wouldn't file the motion to dismiss the case. The Canadian government didn't want to take the risk of losing the whole case just to please the U.S. prosecutors, so they agreed to Frank's offer. This meant Frank wouldn't have to go to jail in the U.S. After spending six weeks in jail, Frank's lawyer arranged for him to be released on bail, which he paid $10,000 for. At this point, the prosecutors were happy with the evidence they had about the million dollars found during the raid, but they were still digging through Frank's computer to find out how much fake money he had made and where it might be hidden. When Frank was released temporarily, he got a job in construction. He spent his free time apologizing to his girlfriend and made sure to stay away from the farmer's garage where he stored the $200 million counterfeit money. The government was doing everything possible to build a strong case against Frank. He noticed strange cars following him and he suspected his phone was being tapped, 
To be safe, he avoided talking about the money to anyone and tried to forget about it. In September 2012, Frank received an email from someone interested in buying the printing press he had listed online. But Frank sensed something wasn't right and stopped responding to the emails. It turned out the buyer was actually an undercover cop trying to catch him selling counterfeit equipment. After a year of negotiating with Frank's lawyer, the government offered Frank a lenient deal. Three years in prison, but he would likely only serve six months. Despite his lawyer's advice, Frank turned down the offer. In December 2013, a year and a half after his arrest, Frank's case finally went to trial. On the day of the trial, as he walked into the courtroom with his lawyer, Frank revealed a secret he had kept from his lawyer. He claimed he had 200 million. He offered to give all the money and his printing press machine if the government would stop trying to take his girlfriend's house and return his car. He also wanted his jail sentence reduced to the six weeks he had already served. And guess what? Deal was accepted. But Frank Barassa was a genius counterfeiter. He printed $250 million in fake money, but claimed he only printed $200 million. I printed $250 million before I even sold one. I gave back $200 million. So uh, you do the math. <laughs>